Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you're new here, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm so glad you found me. If you've been here before, welcome back. I'm so glad that you're here to hang out today, and I can't wait. I'm super excited about tonight's mafioso because I feel like I've been tiptoeing around him for like a really long time. I feel like I've done an episode on him before and I haven't, but it's just because of how much he comes up in my other mafia videos that it feels like I've already given a whole story about him. But I do feel like he deserves his own moment, so I decided to give him his own video. So I've decided to stick with this style of dressing, uh, the sweaters and the big t-shirts, instead of the way that I used to dress in my videos. Because I'm not gonna lie, it's been really nice for the last two videos not getting called a whore once a day. You'd be surprised at the nasty things that people do not feel bad about commenting on my videos. I get very low user engagement, but at least half of it is women telling me that I should be ashamed of myself, I'm a slut, I'm a whore, I'm a bad influence on little girls, blah blah blah. So I typically try to ignore people who say stuff like that, but Having the last few videos where I'm not getting constantly attacked for the way that I dress and the things that I'm showing has been kind of nice, not gonna lie. So I think it's unanimous and this is the way that I should be dressing, so this is the way I am going to dress, so uh, expect that from now on. There's a lot to get into tonight because this man made moves in his lifetime. So let's get into it. Francesco Castiglia was born on January 26th, 1891 in Laropoli, Italy. Laropoli is a frazione of Cassano Allo Iona in Casanza. I'm sorry, I know I just butchered the shit out of that name. Casanza is in the Calabria region of Italy. Not gonna lie to you, have no idea where it is. I've looked at it on a map, but it's just, it's not my country, so I... I get it, but it's kind of, there's, there's regions and I don't know what a frazione is and, but that's where he's from. This is where he was born. Now what I'm about to tell you doesn't really make sense to me, but I'm just going to tell you because it's all I can find online. His parents were Luigi Castiglia Castello and Maria Saviera Alois Castello. It doesn't make sense to me because Later on, Frank makes up his last name. We go through it. So I don't know how Maria and Luigi would have Castello as a last name if Frank made it up, but whatever, we're going to go with it. So his parents, Luigi Castiglia Castello and Maria Saviera Alois Castello had six children together. They had two sons together. The first was named Edward and the second was named Francisco, Francesco. Francesco. Let's go with Francesco. They also had four daughters. Their names were Conchetta, Sadia, May, and Saletta. Frank was the youngest of all of the children, and that's pretty telling because usually the baby of the family kind of has a tendency to disregard authority. So it makes sense that he's the baby of the family. It's always the baby that gets away with everything and thinks that the rules don't apply to him. So it makes sense. In Italy, Luigi had been part of the army of Giuseppe Garibaldi, one of the leaders of the fight for unification. He had been given $2 a month upon his end of service, so pretty much like a retirement pay. Here you go, here's $2 a month. When he got out of the army, he took a position as a game warden for one of the landowners. His position in farming and being a game warden was not an easy occupation. Maria also worked here and there as a spinner or a weaver of cloth. She was also a seamstress back in Italy, so she always had something going on. The family was pretty substantially in debt. Neither parent made a lot of money and they just had to borrow money to get by. His father headed to America in 1895 with two of his sisters and Eduardo to get things set up in America there, and then the plan was to send for Maria and the rest of the family. He got to America and opened an Italian grocery store in New York. He lived there with his two daughters and Eduardo for a few months, and then he let Maria know, like, hey, it's okay, come on over, I set everything up. He had gotten housing, he had gotten 
a store. So he got everything set up for Maria to come. When he called her, he told her, I don't have money right now to send you to get you here. So just do what you got to do. Sell everything that we own and just figure out how to get enough money to get you and the two kids over here to America. A few months after Luigi left, Maria sold everything in Calabria that she owned from the bed sheets on the beds to the family vineyard, and she headed for Naples. From Naples, she boarded a tightly, tightly packed passenger ship with third-class tickets with four-year-old Francesco and her daughter May. The ship was bound for Ellis Island, so that's where they came in. The family left behind one daughter who just didn't want to go to America. She was old enough by this point to kind of take care of herself. She, they left her with a relative, so they didn't leave her on her own, but she was old enough to make the decision that she didn't want to go to a completely new and strange country, so they left her with some relatives and they sailed off. The trip was very long and very uncomfortable. It took about 40 to 90 days typically to get through this trip, which, holy shit, can we give Maria a huge pat on the back for surviving this long ass trip with two very, very young children in a packed out passenger ship with third class tickets for two to three months? Like, go Maria, she is a freaking G, man. I couldn't imagine. I would never be able to. Uh-uh. Not me. They arrived in New York on April 2nd, 1895, when Francesco was four years old. Now, this is during the Italian diaspora. The diaspora is just pretty much a large-scale emigration of Italians from Italy. Two decades after the unification of Italy, the first Italian diaspora started around 1880, and it ended around the 1920s and it ended with the rise of fascist Italy. They typically emigrated because of crushing poverty in the area that had taken over all of Italy, and there was a serious lack of land as property, so people couldn't buy land, so they started to become poorer and poorer because they didn't have land as an asset. So even if they did have a place to live, it would be rented. That's not their asset. They're just paying to live there. And the lack of land kind of came from land being owned and subdivided over generations. So it just had been owned forever and people didn't sell their land. They just left it to their children and their children and their children and they cut it up as time went on. But at the end of the day, there was no land to buy. There was also practically no modern industry and an overpopulation of people because the unification of Italy had brought improvements to life so people started having kids and now we're at the point that there's no land, there's overpopulation, there's not enough money to take care of this overpopulation and things start to go south so people start to emigrate from Italy. The unification of Italy, or the Risorgimento, which is Italian for resurgence, was a political and social movement that resulted in the consolidation of different states of the Italian peninsula into a single state. So pretty much each part of the peninsula of Italy had been separate states. When the unification happened, the entire peninsula just became one great big state. When it became one great state, it was called the Kingdom of Italy. Rebellions in the 1820s and the 1830s against the outcome of the Congress of Vienna, the revolutions of 1848, and the capture of Rome and its designation as the capital of the Kingdom of Italy all kind of led to this diaspora. So there's literally a melting pot and just everything's getting thrown into it and everything hits at once. And now all the people of Italy are like, yeah, we need to get out of here. So they start leaving. There's also earthquakes going on that's really messing people's stuff up. There's soil erosion, so farming is really hard. So if farming is really hard, you start to see it be very hard to create food. And now this government is newly formed and they need to pay for all of this stuff. So what do they do? They raise taxes. So taxes are out of control there with an overpopulation of people that are poor. So people are just not making it. 
While all of this is going on in Italy, Anthony Caminetti was the first American-born Italian-American to be elected in the state assembly, and then he was later elected into the House of Representatives. So this is a huge sign that Italians can go to America and actually make something of themselves. Even though they're foreigners, they can get into government. This, this guy getting that position is showing Italians from across the sea that there's a huge amount of opportunity over in America. It made everybody think that America is the land of possibilities. It's the land where dreams come true. And it becomes the main destination for a huge number of emigrants of Italy to head to America in hopes of a better life. In the 1880s, 300,000 people arrived to America from Italy. In the 1890s, it was 600,000. And then between 1900 and 1910, 2 million Italians landed in America. So the number of Italians in America is starting to exponentially grow. The number growing as fast as it was made it really easy for Italians to come to America and find their people in America. Places like Little Italy in East Harlem were secured for Italian immigrant homes, so everyone went to this tiny little town in East Harlem. This is actually a different Little Italy than we know today. When I first was talking about Gallucci and they were talking about Little Italy and they were talking about Harlem, I was absolutely lost because I'm sitting there, I'm like, I could have sworn Little Italy was downtown. I don't get how I was so wrong about that. I, I lived in New York my whole life. Like, I lived downtown in Manhattan. How the hell did I not know? that Little Italy is in Harlem. But like, okay, I mean, you know, that's that's what it says, I, I believe you. But it turns out that the Little Italy from back then was a different neighborhood than it is now. Today, Little Italy is downtown. It's bounded on the west by Tribeca and Soho, on the south by Chinatown, on the east by Bowery and the Lower East Side, and on the north by Nolita. Back then, it was, 96th Street to 125th Street. On the east, it was bound by Lexington, and it was east of Madison between 116th Street and 125th Street. Back then, it was three times the size of present-day Little Italy, and it held 100,000 Italians in this small little section of East Harlem. And that makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you have lived in New York a while, you've definitely watched the presence of Italian culture just kind of leave New York. And I think that's just because it's cycling through the generations. And plus, Italian culture has kind of became American culture. You know, things like pasta and pizza, that kind of took on an American quality. Like, I, if I think about things that Americans have, pizza is, is up there as one of the number one things, but it's not American. It came from Italy, which I've heard it didn't really come from Italy. I've heard that, like, pizza was never a thing that was actually made in Italy, that we just kind of made it up and called it Italian. Um, I don't know the truth to that because I do know that they sell pizza in Italy, so I really don't know the truth to that, but I do know that I heard that once, that, like, Americans just made pizza and, like, said that it was Italian, but, like, Italians would never have pizza. I, I don't know. But yeah, so the Italian culture started to seep into American culture, and so now instead of having, you know, little blocks that are designated for Italians, it kind of turned into the whole country being very Italian-leaning. And there wasn't areas that were, like, specifically designed for Italian culture. Luigi worked as a day laborer once Maria got to America. He had opened up the store, but he had Maria run the store. And he went to work as a laborer, breaking stone at the reservoir system in Westchester County. And he left Maria to run the family business, the Italian grocery store, and I think that was just because the store was already created. Maria could do that. It's not like she could go out and break bricks at the reservoir system, so 
that sounds like the absolute most miserable job ever. Like, they literally have prisons that are dedicated to having people do hard labor, which is breaking stones and rocks and stuff. So having to do that as a job rather than a punishment, it just seems absolutely miserable. So I hope he was making a lot of money, but I don't think he was. But I'm not gonna lie, it is very nice to see an Italian wife that isn't a stay-at-home mom or a seamstress because it seems like all Italian mothers only do those two things. So to see an Italian woman step out of those roles that are just kind of put in place by society, it's, it's awesome. I like it. Francesco started to develop a hatred for his father. He loved his father himself, but he hated the fact that he picked up the family, he moved them to America, he owned a store, he went out to work every day on top of that, but the family was still poor. With seven mouths to feed, the money that was coming in from those two sources, it just wasn't enough. He started to view the working man overall as weak, as poor, as stupid, and pretty much as a loser. He knew that there had to be a better way out there. This was not the only option for his future. There's no way that it was. There had to be something better, something else that he could do. He would wander the streets just kicking rocks and pondering about ways to live a better life and figure out how to grow up and make his life better than what he's seen so far. Now you have a little boy wandering the streets in East Harlem. We all know what comes next. There was a woman named Pascarella Spinelli that lived on East 109th Street. She operated a horse stable that was really a front for a business that sold stolen horses. The business was located at 334 East 108th Street. There was rumors that she used to let all the criminals in the area come and bury the people that they killed on her land, and her property became known as the Murder Stable. There's nothing to indicate that that is actually true. They never dug up any bones or anything. But at the end of the day, it's definitely what the people in the area believed, and it really kind of doesn't matter if it was ever substantiated or if it was true or not. That's just what everybody believed. There definitely was some facts that were proven about her. Over the years, at least a dozen men were either killed in or near the horse stables. On October 29th, 1911, Nellie Lanier, Pascarella's daughter, reported to police that Frank Chick Monaco, a well-known Harlem gangster, was dead at the house. She came to the police and told them that he had met an accident. His accident was that he had gotten stabbed 25 times in the back. She said that she had killed him to keep her family safe because he was attempting to rob the family. The police absolutely did not believe her whatsoever. For one thing, she showed up at the police station clean. Somebody that had just stabbed somebody 25 times would be absolutely splattered and covered in blood. But she has not a speck of blood on her. It's said that they had her committed to the tombs by Coroner Feinberg. I'm assuming that means arrested, but it might just mean that they put her in like a mental institution. I'm not really sure, but she got committed to the tombs by Coroner Feinberg. When she got there, she told her story, and she said that she had been married to Gaetano Napolitano in 1909, but he disappeared before the church ceremony was completed, so they had, you know, a quickie wedding at the chapel, but before they were able to have a public wedding, he just disappeared. She said that Monaco came to the house saying that he had found Napolitano and lured her to a cottage in Westchester where he robbed her and held her captive for two days. They don't really say how he ended up at her house. Maybe she said that like she told him she would pay him if he brought her home, something I'm not really sure. They didn't specify exactly how he got to the house from Westchester, but I mean, he was there. 
She was acquitted of all charges by the coroner's jury due to lack of evidence. So see, there's a coroner's jury. I think that it just meant that she had been arrested and put in, in jail because a mental institution wouldn't have a jury. So I don't know what that is. I mean, that's like way, way before any time I've kind of done research. So it makes sense that maybe the terms would be different. Either way, they couldn't prove whether or not she had actually committed the crime. They couldn't prove if she was lying. They couldn't prove if she had been held captive. The man was dead. He couldn't corroborate or say she was lying, and there was nothing they could do, so they set her free. The real truth was that Monica was a member of Spinelli's horse theft ring. And he had started to use his position within the family and his knowledge of the dealings of Pascarella to blackmail the family. Somebody in the Spinelli home killed him to prevent him from leaking their precious secrets because they're criminals. It would be a serious problem if someone from within the family went and started to tell everybody about what they did. So somebody in the household killed him. And the daughter just knew she was the most likely to get away with it because she really didn't have a history of any crimes or anything. So if she comes forward and says it was self-defense, they're a lot more likely to believe her than Pascarella, who had been arrested a bunch of times. This is a story that I talked about in the Gallucci video, so it's kind of funny that it's coming full circle here. But there was a man named Aniello Prisco. Everybody called Aniello Zopo the Gimp. I talked about him in my Gallucci video because he was the actual leader of the Black Hand extortion racket in New York. In that video, it was brought up because they had kind of accused Gallucci of being the leader of the Black Hand. Aniello Prisco was the actual leader of the Black Hand. Here, he's being mentioned because he swore revenge on the family for the killing of Monica. Monica was his friend. They killed him. He's mad. Even after Pascarella moved, the reason that she gave to the public was so that she could be closer to the stables, but it's pretty clear that she was trying to get away from Aniello. Zopo the Gimp found her, and less than a month after Monica was killed, Zopo had Pascarella killed on the street in front of her house with two bullets to the head. Or that was the prevailing theory. I'm not really sure. When I talked about him in my Gallucci video, it was to talk about how he was killed at Gallucci's house by Gallucci's nephew. He had killed Gallucci's brother because Gallucci refused to make payments to the Black Hand. He was like, you're ne no, you're not going to extort me. Absolutely not. So they tricked Zopo the Gimp into coming to Gallucci's bakery. And then once he was there, John Russomano killed him. Sorry, my hair is bothering me, so you're going to see me moving it around every two seconds. It's irritating me. After Russomano killed Zopo the Gimp, it was celebrated in newspapers. The headlines printed, Prisco, lame gunman, meets death at last, little Italy relieved. Zopo the terror dies as he draws his weapon to kill. Russomano was put on trial for the murder, but he was found not guilty after he claimed that Prisco had tried to kill him, so he killed him in self-defense. Years later, it was reported by an informant that Gallucci had actually killed Spinelli because he wanted to take over her horse stable. Anyway, the whole point of that whole kind of rambling story was that this is all going on in Francesco's neighborhood. Pascarella lived right down the block from him. All of this information is widely distributed in the newspapers, and although he never worked for her, he definitely knew of her, and he definitely knew that she was really wealthy because of her criminal enterprise. The newspapers called her the wealthiest woman in Little Italy. He lived at 222 East 108th Street. Her stables were at 334 East 108th Street. So it doesn't seem like it's that far away, but in East Harlem housing projects, it definitely could be a decent distance away, but it is on the same road. With Francesco's hatred for the poor living conditions that being a working man led to, 
and his really close proximity to really wealthy criminals, it was only a matter of time before he got involved himself. It was going to happen. Even though there was never any proof that Francesco worked for Spinelli, he spent a lot of time hanging out under the tree in front of her property and just kind of watching how everything went. Who came, who left, just kind of scoping the place out. He never did anything bad to it. He just kind of watched. His brother Eduardo showed him the ropes and taught him how to be a criminal when he was about 13 years old. All these gangsters started doing crazy shit when they were like 13 years old. Virginia Hill started having sex at 13. Francesco started doing crimes. I mean, like, I was, I was a wild child, so I'm not really one to talk, but... I feel like 13 year olds should be playing with Barbies, not gallivanting around having sex and committing crimes. He dropped out of school in the sixth grade at 14 years old. 14 years old is really old to be in the sixth grade, so he definitely got left back a time or two. You're definitely not supposed to be in sixth grade at 14 years old. At 13 years old, he's being shown the ropes of the criminal underworld and he joined a gang. He started using the name Frankie because it was a lot tougher and easier to say than Francesco. The gang that he joined wasn't an Italian gang, it was just kind of a gang. And Francesco Castiglia was a very Italian name. He adopted the name Frankie Costello, which was an Irish version of his name, which really doesn't make sense to me because I hear the name Costello and I immediately think Italian. People make jokes about Italians all the time and how, like, if her name ends in a vowel, she's crazy, blah, blah, blah. Or, like, if her name ends in a vowel, she's got eight brothers, stuff like that. Just pretty much saying, like, if her name ends in a vowel, she's Italian and then some Italian stereotype, which, I mean, it's funny, you know, it's no big deal. But anytime I hear a name that ends in a vowel, I kind of think Italian. So to say that Costello is an Irish name, it's weird. I don't know. As a kid, Frank overheard his mom being yelled at by the landlady that owned the building that the family lived in because she wasn't able to pay the rent that month. Frank's way to handle this? He had been injured recently. He hurt his leg doing something. He had like a big wound on his leg. And in the middle of the night with an injured leg, he goes and robs this landlady. Apparently he didn't wear a mask or anything because the woman knew exactly who he was right away. She made a beeline for their apartment, knocks on the door, and tells his mom like, hey, your son just robbed me. He's really smart though because this whole weekend he had been staying with his aunt in Astoria. So when she knocks on the family's door, his mom is like, uh, no, nice try, lady. But my son is in Astoria at his aunt's house. He's been gone for days, so nice try, but it wasn't him. So now obviously the landlady calls the cops, and when the cops come, Frankie's mom tells the cops the same thing. He's staying with his aunt, he's in Astoria, go check if you'd like, but he's not here and he hasn't been here all weekend. So the cops do exactly that. They go to Astoria and they check in, and by the time they get there, Costello is asleep in bed with a bandage on his leg, and his sister's like, um, he's really hurt. Like, he couldn't make it to Manhattan. You're out of your goddamn mind. There's no way he can make it from Astoria to East Harlem. It just wouldn't happen. It's too far. He's too injured. So the cops are like, all right, but I mean, <laughs> sucks to be you, lady, but uh, it wasn't this kid. So he gets away with it, scot-free. No problems, no issues, no nothing. He starts hanging out with this 15-year-old girl. This scandalous girl would give him wine. And he said that every time he drank, her hair would get more and more and more silky. He lost his virginity to this girl. They don't name her anywhere. He's 13. He loses his virginity to this 15-year-old girl who snuck him alcohol every now and then. He went out and got his own apartment eventually, obviously. But things got pretty tight at one point, and he wasn't able to pay his rent on time. He's probably around, like, I don't know, 16, 17 at the time. And his landlord came and kicked the absolute shit out of this boy. And he definitely learned his lesson and he was never late for his rent ever again. <laughs> when he was 17 years old on April 25th, which, by the way, that's my birthday, in 1908, Casella was arrested for the first time. 
The charges were for trying to extort a coal merchant in the Bronx. These charges were dismissed. He didn't get in trouble for them. He was arrested again when he was 21 years old, but again, got off with no consequences. This one was for attempted robbery when he tried to steal money and jewelry from a woman living nearby. In 1910, the family began using the name Castello with an A, C-A-S-T, on the census, and when he had been arrested at that time, he used the name Frank Costello with an O, C-O-S-T. Costello started running around in the same circle as some of the guys from the Morello gang, and he became a member of the Morello gang pretty quickly. In the Morello gang, Costello quickly met a man named Charles Luciana. Together, the two boys formed a gang with two Jewish boys that Luciana had known since childhood, Bugsy Siegel and Meyer Lansky. The group of four quickly grew into a group of 20, and the crew started to pull in some real money. They stole from stores, warehouses, banks, and they started to be known around town as the Five Points Gang. Costello went to a friend's house to hang out one day, and he met his sister, Loretta Giegerman. She was a Jewish woman, and her brother was one of Costello's best friends, Dudley Giegerman. It was absolutely perfect. She was only four years younger than him, and she was an absolute knockout. The girl was gorgeous. A weird thing about the marriage is that there's two different dates reported for the date that they were married. Half say that it was in 1914, when Costello was 23 years old, and half say it was in 1918, putting him at 27 years old. I don't really know why the two dates are so different, but so widely reported. I see each one of the dates in multiple places. The actual date that they were married was December 22nd, 1914. Costello called her Bobby. Maybe it was her middle name because it's nothing like her first name of Loretta, but he called her Bobby as a pet name. On their marriage certificate, he listed his occupation as a plumber. In March of 1915, Costello was arrested for carrying an illegal concealed weapon. A cop noticed that the weapon was on him in his pants and he started chasing him. Costello threw the weapon, but it was found pretty quickly and he was also found as well. This time, he didn't just skate by as he did the previous two. The judge actually saw the previous two charges and even though he was never found guilty of anything or served any time or anything like that, the judge did not like the fact that he had been arrested twice already. He was sentenced to a year in prison, and he ended up serving 11 months. After he did 11 months in prison, Costello vowed that he would never carry a concealed weapon on him again, and when he would talk to people, he would tell them that he actually went through with that and never carried a concealed weapon on him again. That was disproven. He did end up having to carry a concealed weapon and almost use it quite a few times, but he made it a habit to not have one on him, which was strange. It was very different than the rest of the mafia guys that were running around strapped all the time. As much as this man is a legend in organized crime, it's not verified if he ever actually killed somebody. He preferred to work with his brains rather than his heart or with violence. It also didn't hurt that he had an enormous amount of people around him that were more than willing to kill somebody if the need arose. His marriage certificate is the first official place that he ever put his name as Frank Costello. After Gallucci was killed with his son, Morello stepped back into the role of boss of the area. It's funny because, for the most part, my videos usually coincide with only one member that I've already covered before. I really thought that with Frank it was going to be Luciano, but there's a lot of intersections so far with Gallucci. I talked about Morello a lot in the Gallucci video. Morello had been the boss of the Navy Street Gang until he went to prison at the same time as Ignazio Lupo, who was another boss in the area. When the two went to prison, it left an opening that Gallucci stepped into and took over as the boss. Well, once Gallucci was killed, Morello stepped back into that role and took over as the boss again. Costello was really upset that he went to prison, but it was probably the best thing that could have happened to him, honestly. He was in jail for a bulk of the Mafia Camorra War, which ran from 1916 to 1918. 
He also worked for Morello, so he definitely would have been involved in the Mafia Camorra War. Luciano made it through unscathed, so there's a strong possibility that Costello would have as well, but his chances of survival rose 100% by remaining in prison for most of the war. He started working with a Jewish man named Henry Horowitz. In order to start a business with Horowitz, he put $3,000 down on a business and he started working with punch boards. A punch board is kind of like one of those calendars that you see on Christmas that you get a piece of chocolate every day of the month in December. It's kind of like the same idea. You have a piece of cardboard and it has holes in it and you use a stylus to like poke through tissue paper to get a folded piece of paper and this folded piece of paper just like tells you a prize that you could win. They were placed in bars, restaurants, places like that. They were kind of thought of as like gambling and it became illegal but obviously it didn't matter to criminals if it was illegal or not. Especially Costello, who would become the king of gambling later on. He started making the punch boards. He made the prizes that went in the punch board. So, like, he made, like, the little dolls. A lot of time, your prize was a doll. And he started marketing them as well. Costello ended up making over $100,000 a year, but then he filed for bankruptcy. The business filing for bankruptcy was not really that big of a deal. It was something that kind of typically happened. It's kind of surprising that the business was able to declare bankruptcy because their main objective was to do punch boards and punch boards were illegal, but whatever they said that the business was actually, instead of saying it was for punch boards, I'm sure that they said that, you know, it was to sell dolls or something, and that business declared bankruptcy. And usually it's just the legal way of getting out of your official debt. You know, you have credit card debt, you have all that kind of stuff. You can get out of it just by declaring bankruptcy. Luciano and Costello, along with Lansky and Siegel, started working for Arnold Rothstein, a Jewish mafia boss in Manhattan. Rothstein was a professional gambler. He made money in card games. He made a lot of his money in poker. He also rigged games, which, like, if there was a boxing match, he would rig it so that the one person won, and then he would bet that that person would win. He would rig baseball games. He had something to do with the 1919 World Series. If you're interested in that, go watch the Luciano video, because I put a lot of information about the 1919 World Series and how it was rigged and... Arnold Rothstein's involvement in the rigging of the World Series. So I went pretty in depth into that topic on the Luciano video. So if you're interested, go check out that video. Rothstein financed the entire crew's illegal activities. He helped finance the bootlegging. He helped finance the drugs so that they could buy the drugs so that they could sell them and just pretty much gave them money and loans to do whatever they needed to do. Rothstein protected himself by being heavily involved in politics, namely in Tammany Hall. Tammany Hall is a democratic political group that ran New York politics for in the entirety of the 1800s. The group of politicians controlled all of New York politics from 1790 to 1960 and had a huge hand in helping immigrants rise in politics in America. Costello actually took a lot from the relationship with Rothstein, but one of the major things that he took away from it was that being a criminal was a whole lot easier when you had friends in politics. It changed the way your entire empire ran. You were less likely to go to jail. If you did go to jail, your treatment in jail was a whole lot nicer. It helped protect your friends. There really was no bad side to having politicians on your side. The only semi-bad thing I guess you can consider is the gigantic price that it took to get politicians in your pocket. When the crew grew from the original four to the 20, one of the people that came on board was Vito Genovese. Genovese is actual literal swine, like the worst, grossest human being in all of mankind. I'm going to go a lot more into why I think that and a lot more into him in general later on in this video, but for now, I'll just use this example. 
He had a serious issue working with Lansky and Siegel. When Luciano brought them to meet Genovese for the first time, because he had had kind of this crew of new people working away from Lansky and Siegel so that they could kind of protect themselves. So when he brought Lansky and Siegel around for the first time, Genovese turned around to Luciano and said, what are you trying to do? Load us up with a bunch of heaps? Like he's always done, Luciano put him in his place real freaking quick. Luciano responded, Take it easy, Don Vitone. You're nothing but a fucking foreigner yourself. Like most other times that Luciano shut his shit down, he sat down and shut the hell up and had nothing further to say. Costello's father, Luigi, died on December 12th, 1921 from bronchitis and chronic heart failure. His mom had diabetes, and Costello definitely played the role of, like, baby of the family all the way through. He was really close with his mom, so after his dad passed away, he helped his mom move to Astoria, and he moved to Bayside with Loretta so that they could be close to their mom's apartment in Astoria. Costello was a multi-millionaire before he hit the age of 35. That's pretty impressive considering I've done absolutely nothing by the time I hit 35. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I am nowhere close to 35. But yeah, he's sitting on more than $2 million by the time he hits 35 years old. It's a lot easier to figure out how he got there when we look at the fact that Prohibition hit when he was 29 years old. So Prohibition hit, and it pretty much made every person in the Mafia just, like, instantly rich. Bootlegging and Prohibition was just the greatest thing that could have ever happened to the Mafia. It was a money machine. It made everybody richer than they had ever imagined they'd be. You know what's wild? I always look at Prohibition and, like, when people talk about it, I always think of it as, like, this blemish in American history that was just, like, bing, bang, boom, one and done. It was quickly put in place. It was quickly taken apart. But it really didn't. It lasted a really long time. Did you know Prohibition lasted 13 years? 13 years! It started on January 17th, 1920, and it ended on December 5th, 1933. That is 13 full years. Like, I was watching Boardwalk Empire, and I hit the fourth season, and my stupid dad moved, and I lost HBO. So I can't finish the show right now. But while I'm watching it, I'm like, waiting for these big moments in mafia history to happen. And I'm like, oh, that has to have happened because the show is based around when Prohibition happened. And in my head, Prohibition didn't really last that long. So I'm like, oh, these events would have had to happen during the time that this show was on. But then I think about the fact that Prohibition lasted 13 years and the show was only on for, I think, like five seasons. But the whole time I'm watching it, I'm like, If this was real, Maranzano would be around by now. If this was real, the Castella Marisi War would start by now. But I never really stopped to think about the fact that Prohibition was a really, really broad time. And like, yeah, we can assume that the series starts in 1920 because Prohibition starts during the first episode of Boardwalk Empire. But there's 13 years that that shit went on. So to know that something happened during Prohibition doesn't automatically mean that it happened within this short little period of time. In 1925, Costello had a multi-million dollar bootlegging business going on. The prohibition agents slash IRS agents, I don't really know. It's weird. When you hear them talk about it on TV shows or like movies, they usually say that they're revenue agents or like IRS agents. So I'm not sure. I think that the responsibility to upholds prohibition laws kind of fell on a bunch of different agencies, but I think that it was the IRS for the most part. Well, these agents, they ran up on Costello's main operation. At the end of it, they raided and confiscated $40 million worth of illegal alcohol. That's gotta be a huge hit. Like, I don't care how much money you're worth or how much alcohol you're running, $40 $40 million, especially in that day and age, that's not today's money. That's that day's money. So that is a huge hit, no matter what. It's literally almost career-ending, regardless of how much alcohol you're moving. So obviously, with this huge amount of alcohol that was raided, obviously charges are pressed. The agents charged him with bootlegging, and it should have been a super quick open-and-shut case, but it ended in a hung jury. 
Costello said that he hung it, so obviously that means that he paid off a juror. He did something to make that case end in a hung jury. Whatever he did worked, and he walked away a free man after agents personally laid hands on $40 million worth of product that he was selling, which is wild. Wild. Costello and Loretta went on vacation to celebrate getting off of the charges. They decided to go back to the motherland, and they went to the town that Costello had been born in. When they arrived, they headed straight for Costello's sister, You remember at the beginning of the video when I said that there was one daughter that she didn't want to go to America, so she stayed in Italy. Do you remember? I knew you'd remember. You're paying super close attention. Thank you. Well, he heads straight for the sister, and it's very possible that Frank isn't fluent in Italian. When he got to Italy and he met up with his sister, the entire town came to the center of the town to meet him. By this time, he's in his mid-40s, He's in the newspaper on a regular basis. Italy and the rest of the world pays attention to the news in America, so they know who he is from the newspapers. And everybody wants to meet him, lay eyes on him, and just kind of, you know, when a celebrity comes to town, you kind of just want to be able to say that you saw him. So that's what this town does, and they all go to the center of the town to meet him. His sister translated his tales of fortune and success in America to all the townspeople. So pretty much he was like, yeah, you know, I make money. I make this amount of money. And I've hobnobbed with this person and this celebrity that you've heard about. So pretty much he just told his success story. They all oohed and odd and, you know, kissed the ground that he walked on. And they literally made a collective decision and they wanted to name the town after him. They really wanted to rename the town that they lived in that had probably had its name for hundreds of years. After this criminal bootlegger who just skated on a $40 million bootlegging charge because he was born there and now he's rich. I mean, it's pretty cool. Frank Costello seems like a super chill dude, but to rename a town after him, I don't know. It it seems kind of OD to me. It seems kind of crazy. He thought so too. He said it was way too much and he didn't let them do it. So no, there's no town in Italy called like Costello Village or anything like that. He wasn't okay with it, so he didn't let them do it. Costello had been bootlegging with Irish crime bosses Dwyer and Madden. The three created a rum running business and they called themselves the Combine. On November 19th, 1926, Costello and Dwyer were indicted on federal bootlegging charges. These are the bootlegging charges from before. They were accused of bribing two U.S. Coast Guardsmen, presumably so that they wouldn't come and disturb their process of getting alcohol from the boats onto the harbor. The largest boat in the Combine fleet could carry 20,000 cases of liquor. Picture that. Picture 20,000 cases of liquor. Now picture them all on a boat. So this is a stacked boat. In January of 1927, the jury deadlocked on the bootlegging charges for both Dwyer and Costello. So this is the hung jury that I was talking about. In 1926, Dwyer was convicted of bribing a Coast Guard agent, and he was sentenced to two years in jail. After Dwyer was imprisoned, Costello took over the Combine's operations with Madden. This caused a lot of friction between Madden and a top Dwyer lieutenant, Charles Vanny Higgins. Higgins believed that he should be the one that was in charge. He was upset because Costello and Madden had teamed up to take care of and run the combine. Higgins is like, no, that's not fair. I'm the best person doing this. You don't belong taking care of this. You don't belong running it. I should be running it. So now there's some friction between the group. This began the Manhattan Beer Wars between Higgins on one side and Costello, Madden, and Schultz on the other. Now these are three notorious names. These are the biggest players in the game. So how there was even a war between Higgins and these three heavyweights is beyond me. But at the time, Schultz was also having issues with someone. Schultz was having issues with Jack Legs Diamond and Vincent Mad Dog Call, who had begun to rival Schultz and his partners with Higgins' help. Vincent Mad Dog Call is the one that was actually hired to kill Luciano, 
by Maranzano. He's the one that he was, like, heading up to kill Luciano, but Luciano ended up having his people kill Maranzano first. So when Cal was coming up, those killers were coming down. Cal thought that they were real cops because they had dressed up as police officers. So Cal went running the other way. Obviously, he didn't get the job done because Maranzano died, so... It would have been a little silly to kill Luciano for a dead man, so he didn't end up doing it. But now he and Jack Legs Diamond are on the side of Higgins, so it just kind of uh, devolves into this big issue between heavyweights in the town. Eventually, the Costello, Madden, Schultz alliance was destroyed in the New York underworld, so they did end up winning. So, you know, the... The underdogs came up and they won. So that's something that you don't see very often. So you got these big names that are taken down. I mean, they didn't get taken down, obviously. They kept operating, but their alliance together got taken down, which is is fine. They each went on to do a lot of things on their own. So no love lost, who cares? In the late 1920s, John Torrio helped to organize a loose cartel-ish kind of thing of the East Coast bootleggers. He called it the Big Seven. The Big Seven was a number of prominent gangsters that included Costello, Luciano, Longies Wellman, Joe Adonis, Meyer Lansky, and obviously Johnny Torrio. Torrio also supported the creation of a national body that would prevent the sort of all-out wars over turf that had kind of broken out in both New York and Chicago. His idea was really well received. A lot of people liked it, and a conference was held in Atlantic City by Torrio. We'll go over this conference a little bit more in depth later in the video, but the National Crime Syndicate did come out of it, and that all came from these wars between Costello, Matt, and Schultz, Jack Legs Diamond, Vincent Mad Dog Call. All of these guys are having wars, and that is what led up to the Atlantic City Conference. In 1929, Costello had become kind of like a judge for mafia affairs. The official mafia that we know today wasn't in place yet, but there was a mafia. The underground group of Italian mobsters, they just came from mafia families rather than the way, the structured way that we know it now. It was just kind of, there was factions in the city and it wasn't structured. There wasn't like, you know, an official five families or anything, but there was a mafia. And Costello became the judge of things that went on between the mafia members in the underground world. The costello Marisi War started in 1930 and Costello had already gotten a reputation as kind of the peacemaker, the judge of the underworld by 1929. On February 14th, 1929, we all know that the St. Valentine's Day Massacre took place. I don't really want to go into it much here because I'm going to go really, really in-depth into this topic on my redo of the Al Capone video. Listen, I've been purposefully avoiding that episode. I know that it needs to be redone, but I'm really trying to wait until after I finished Boardwalk Empire and forgot the series exists. If you ever saw the first video that I did of Al Capone, I think it's still up on my page. It was filmed shitty and it was not fully researched, so it's not a great video. Don't go and watch that and like use it as a reference as to who I am and what videos I do now. But if you did watch the video, you know that I hate Al Capone. And I know if you've been paying attention, it seems like I hate a lot of these mafia guys, which isn't something that people that are interested in the mafia history usually do. They don't usually hate a whole lot of mafia guys. I have a list of about four or five mafia guys that I've researched that I just absolutely despise. First on that list is Vito Genovese, then Al Capone, and then from there on out, like, I'm not a big fan of Aniello Della Croce because I heard that he kicked a dog. That could be just, like, souped up rumors by the FBI. It's very possible that that didn't even happen, or, you know, it could have happened where, like, he came out, he nudged the dog, like, go away, and just, like, pushed it with his leg, and the FBI was like, dog murderer! So, I don't hate him too much, I just, I'm not a fan of him. But Al Capone, I really, really hate because he didn't follow the rules of La Cosa Nostra. He needlessly slaughtered a slew of innocent children, women, families 
for small amounts of profit. It just was unnecessary. So I'm trying to wait until I finish Boardwalk Empire before I redo that video because I really like his character on Boardwalk Empire. And liking his character is really messing with my ability to do a video about a mafia member that I actually hate. I don't want to change my opinion about somebody based on a show that is completely fiction. The show obviously has no idea who this man actually is or what his personality was like. I'm sure even the people who knew him describe him the way that he's portrayed in the show, but a lot of people, when someone dies or they go to prison, they get rose-colored glasses and they talk about... You'll notice if you ever watch, like, true crime shows, every single true crime episode will talk about the victims and just be like, that person used to walk in the room and they would light up the room... And I don't know about you, but most of the people alive right now don't do that. I've never met a person that just like walks in the room and lights up the room. Not every person is just a great person, but once that person dies, everybody just remembers them differently. So even though this probably is the way that the people who knew and loved him explained him and his personality, I don't think that the show is portraying him in a way that they don't think is true, but it's not true. It's not really the way that he was. But again, I'm getting all messed up because I like his character in the show, so I'm just waiting. So that's kind of, I'm just giving you guys a background on why I've been taking my time on redoing that video. I don't want to stop doing videos until I finish Boardwalk Empire, so that's why I've kind of gone off and done a few other Mafia members while I wait, but I'm not gonna let a fictional show skew my view of someone that killed innocent women, men, children, all just for stupid reasons. So yeah, it's on hold. It'll come, it'll come, I promise, one day. I'm especially itching to redo it because I really want to redo my Anastasia video. Anastasia is one of my favorite people, not just in Mafia history, but in world history. I love that man. Like, yeah, he killed a shit ton of people. Okay, I get that. But this man is seriously number one badass, and I really want to retell his story in the way that I do now. Instead of just leaving him in the episode that I did on, like, a first-gen camera and I didn't really do the research the way that I do now, he deserves a redo episode, but I have to redo the Al Capone episode first, so they're both on hold for now. Anyway, Capone carried out the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, which is exactly what it sounds like, a freaking massacre. When Capone went to New York to speak to high-ranking Mafia members regarding the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, Costello advised him to go get himself locked up and let the heat die down. The massacre was against other Mafia members, and there was a lot of anger and outrage and everything going on, not only within the Mafia, but from the public as well. Capone absolutely hated the idea. He's like, what? Go get myself locked up to go to jail? Are you for real, my man? Like, he was not having it. Understandably, who wants to go to jail? Like, nobody wants to go sit in a jail cell. It's not a vacation. It's not a resort. It's a horrible place to be. So he's, like, looking at Costello like, you're out of your goddamn mind. I'm not going to jail on purpose, you weirdo. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of things that you can say about Capone, but that he's stupid is not one of them. He listened to Costello, everybody listened to Costello, and they ended up in the right place at the right time, you know? Everything went well when you listened to Costello, so he listened. And he arranged for himself to be arrested on some petty crime. I think it was like carrying a weapon or, you know, an illegal concealed carry charge. That It was, stu it was stupid. But he got himself locked up, and he was arraigned on May 16th, 1929. And he pled guilty to the charge, and he got a year in prison. He went to prison for a year, and when he got out, nobody was trying to kill him anymore, and the media had died down, on, and they really didn't care too much about the St. Valentine's Day Massacre anymore. So exactly what Costello said would happen, happened. Everything worked out. It just kind of went away for the year that he was in jail. It was only about a year after he got out of jail on that gun charge, that the trial started for the tax evasion that eventually took him down, 
But I don't know about you, but I'd way rather take on the government than a whole slew of mafia members because with the government, you're going to go to jail. With the mafia members, you're going to die. So the way he played it allowed him to get out with his life. I know I've gone through this story a bunch of times, but every time I do a video, I try to assume that people haven't seen my other videos yet. So if I go over a topic more than once, I apologize if you kind of get tired of hearing it, but... I have to go over it again. Rothstein participated in a three-day-long high-stakes poker game, and he ended up owing $320,000 from this game. He claimed that the game was fixed, and it's very likely that it was fixed, and he refused to pay. On November 4th, 1928, during a business meeting that Rothstein was having in Manhattan's Park Central Hotel, George Hump McManus shot Rothstein. He was rushed to the hospital, but he died three days later on November 7th, 1928. The irony was that Rothstein currently had a bet for $500,000 that Herbert Hoover would be elected president the next day. If he had lived to see November 8th, when the presidential election took place, he would have had more than enough money to pay McManus back. That's not to say that he would have paid McManus back. He didn't have the funds, he was low on money, but he also did claim that the game was rigged, and it most likely was. So to say that he would have had the money doesn't mean that he would have paid the money. So it's ironic, but at the same time, I don't think he would have made any decisions differently. McManus was indicted for the murder, but he was acquitted later. And after Rothstein died, Costello and Luciano started to work full-time for Masseria. Even though Costello really loved and idolized Arnold Rothstein, his death may have been the best thing that ever happened to Costello. Even though Luciano would eventually become one of the most powerful mafia bosses in the history, Rothstein knew that Costello was the one that formed strong relationships with people. He was the one that was willing to bend to make people happy. Luciano was very, you're gonna do things my way. Costello was very, let's meet in the middle, let's find a solution that will make us both happy. He was the one who knew when to fight and when to fold Luciano and all the rest of them. They were very, this is going to happen or I'm going to kill you. Costello was the one that was like, you know what, I'm just going to take that L and keep moving. I don't care. He was the one that Rothstein ended up setting up to take over all of his relationships with the politicians from Tammany Hall. Costello had followed in Rothstein's footsteps and really got into gambling pretty hard. When Rothstein died, Costello took over his bookmaking operation and he paid off a shit ton of politicians to get them in his pocket, and he did everything he could to keep as much business legit as he could. Aside from the bookmaking operation, he set up slot machines in every candy store, speakeasy, pharmacy, gas station, bus stop, and restaurant, all of these locations everywhere in New York the part of New York that matters. All of New York City and Long Island got covered in them. All in all, at the end of the day, there was about 5,000 slot machines that he placed in that little tiny area. The area is tiny, but very heavily populated. In 1930, there was just under 7 million people in New York City, and then there was 303,000 people in Nassau County and 161,000 people in Suffolk County. For those of you who don't know, Long Island is made up of two counties, Nassau County and Suffolk County. Queens and Brooklyn are both on Long Island, but their population is included in the New York City population because they're boroughs of New York City. They're also on the very west end of Long Island, so it goes Queens and Brooklyn here, then Nassau, then Suffolk. There's a small section on the easternmost part of Suffolk that is kind of weird. It falls into Peconic County, but Peconic County is still a part of Suffolk County. Sometimes I've wondered if, like, areas in the Peconic County, like the Hamptons and Riverhead, are even a part of Suffolk County, but they are. But they're not. It's weird. It's a weird little situation they got going on. On January 1st, 1930, there were about 32,000 speakeasies in New York City alone. Long Island was the main hub of illegally imported alcohol all throughout Prohibition. Dutch Schultz had an office in Patchogue. The Greenport waterfront restaurants had hidden trap doors in the bottom that allowed for alcohol that was imported from like Canada, the Caribbean, Europe, all to be passed up to the restaurant through the water because the restaurants were on stilts. So the boats would come in underneath the restaurant 
and pass the alcohol up through this little hidden trap door on the floor, and that's how they would ferry it in. Meyer Lansky and Bugsy Siegel would come out to Long Island to negotiate deals about the alcohol. They would send trucks out there. The large rum-running vessels would park far offshore. They parked far offshore because they were slower. They couldn't outrun the Coast Guard. So they would leave them 3 to 12 miles offshore in international waters, so the Coast Guard can't touch them because it's not United States territory. So they would leave them offshore, and they would take these smaller, faster boats, and they would ferry the alcohol from these big ships that are parked in international waters, and they would bring them from the big ships that are too slow to outrun the Coast Guard onto these small ships that could outrun the Coast Guard, and they would bring them to the shore that way. When they brought them to shore, there were trucks waiting where they could take the cargo and either distribute it to the speakeasies on Long Island, or they would bring it through the LIE to Manhattan to be distributed in the city. I heard once somewhere that the Long Island Expressway has transported more drugs on it, and Long Island Expressway is just, I know it goes further, but the main part of the LIE is really just from Riverhead, which is the easternmost part of the island, to the city. So you can literally go from one end of the island all the way to the other, not up and down, but east to west on the LIE. And I've heard somewhere that the LIE has transported more drugs than like any other road in the United States. I don't know how true that is because I feel like it would be 95 because 95 goes up and down the East Coast, but I, I really don't know. Politicians from Tammany Hall would go to Riverhead and have a drink, which meant that none of those locations ever had to worry about a raid. Tammany Hall politicians were the ones giving the orders for raids to be done, and they'd never order agents to raid a location that they enjoyed drinking at. The locations still had provisions in place just in case. They had dumb waiters for if ever there was a raid, the empty glasses could be disposed into these dumb waiters. Suffolk County Police regularly found distilleries on Long Island, which is really surprising because I swear SCPD is the least competent group of human beings on the planet. Just wait, wait until I tell you my story. I really, really hope that one day I hit 100,000 followers because I'm really just itching to tell you my story. And I know after I tell you this story, you're gonna agree that SCPD or Suffolk County Police Department is the biggest group of incompetent human beings on the planet. And this is in modern day. It's not even like back in the 1900s. This all went down in 2015. So, I mean, I want 100,000 followers for a lot of reasons, but my main reason for wanting to hit that number is for this purpose. I set out on this whole road to make videos for that purpose. I started it that day that I decided I wanted to get this story out and I wanted people to hear it. And I'm gonna keep working until I hit that number. And the day I hit that number, I'm gonna come on and tell you the story from my personal standpoint. And I'm super curious to know what people are gonna think about it because there's absolute craziness that has gone down. So yeah, anyway, Prohibition starts and speakeasies start popping up all across New York City and Long Island, and Costello puts slot machines into these speakeasies. He also starts placing them in restaurants and candy shops in the area. The owner of the bar gets a percentage of the income from the slot machine for letting it be in his store and, you know, hiding it from the police. The police and politician get a piece of it for not raiding that location and taking the slot machine, and Costello gets a piece. There was plenty of profit to go around, and there is millions of dollars to be made in this little tiny gambling ring that Costello had set up that became an industry. He quickly rose to the top as New York's top man in the illegal gambling market. He set up business with the Mills Novelty Company and imported slot machines from Chicago. He set up an army of collectors, salesmen, servicemen, and he even had a bunch of police on his payroll so that if any of his slot machines got stolen, they would go track it down and get it back. His main business partner was Phil Dandy Phil Castell. They were even able to keep the cops that they couldn't pay off at bay by making these slot machines pay out a mint. Or they had certain kind of coins that could be redeemed for money by the owner of the bar or restaurant that the slot machine was placed in. 
Castell and Costello started opening up secondary companies. They created the Triangle Mint Company to produce the mints that came out of the slot machines. And then they started to branch out. So they started placing slot machines in Saratoga and in New Jersey. A group of three brothers, the Shapiro brothers in Brownsville, Brooklyn, started to buy and place slot machines to compete with them. But each of the three brothers just so happened to be killed by other gangs in the area. And I'm sure it had nothing to do with Costello. Nothing. Costello would never do that. On May 13th, 1929, a summit of leaders of the underground organized criminals in the U.S. was called in Atlantic City. Meyer Lansky was married, and he decided that it would be best to kind of mix business with pleasure and set up a meeting in Atlantic City, which could kind of double as his honeymoon. So for Meyer, you've got his honeymoon on one side and then business on the other. So a little business and pleasure in one weekend. All the important mafia guys that we talked about a million times are here. Frank Costello, Lucky Luciano, Johnny Torrio, Enoch Johnson. This is where the big seven comes from. There was about 50, 60 very famous mafia members that I'm sure we've all heard their names, but I'm not about to sit here and read off 50, 60 names to you. Historians say that this meeting in Atlantic City was more historic to the underground world than the Appalachian meeting or the Havana conference, which is huge. Those are two really, really big moments for the mafia. So to say that the Atlantic City meeting is bigger than those two events means that this Atlantic City meeting, it was important. It had some serious significance. This is where the creation of the National Syndicate comes from. Nothing's ironed out. They don't have the commission. They don't have anything like that. But they do put in place some kind of ruling body that's going to unite the entire underworld together. So I'm thinking that's probably what this huge thing was that they came to at this meeting was the National Syndicate was officially created. Joe Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano were not invited to this meeting. No mustache peats came. Joseph Bonanno wasn't even invited. And he wasn't even a mustache Pete, but he was so close to Maranzano that Bonanno was kind of a an ally to the Young Turks, but he wasn't a Young Turk. He wasn't a member of the group. He still believed in the old world thinking and the Sicilian traditions, so you don't see Joseph Bonanno at this meeting. The Castello Marisi War was about to break out. They knew it. It's on the horizon. It's about to happen. And there's people at this meeting from both sides of the war. The Young Turks fought against each other in the streets, but late at night, they met up together. Their main objective was never to back up Maranzano or Masseria. The main objective was to put a new organization in place that would profit from working together with the entire country's criminals. So you can go check out my episode of Luciano and watch that entire thing if you're interested in the background and what went into the Castello Marisi War, what happened in the war, why the war started and how it ended. If you're interested in that, you can go check out the Luciano video, but I'll just give a quick brief overview here. On February 26, 1930, one of the leaders of the families in the Mafia was killed because there was two warring sides. Joe Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano, they're fighting in the New York underworld. The leader was killed because he went from Masseria's side over to Maranzano's side. The war was waged and it included most of the big time mafia members that we know from that time period. Under the surface of the Masseria versus Maranzano fight, there's a secondary war going on. The Young Turks are a group of younger people fighting to modernize the mafia and they're up against the Mustache Peets who are the old world gangsters. They believe in Sicilian traditions. They believe in old world rules. They don't want to socialize or do business with anybody that isn't an Italian. They usually have a pretty signature mustache that came down their chins, which is why they got the name the Mustache Pete's because they have a mustache that goes all along here and down their chins. It ended when Lucky Luciano, a top member of Masseria's organization, agreed to betray Masseria and kill him in exchange for Maranzano's agreement to immediately end the war and make him a boss of one of the families that were being established. Maranzano put himself in place as the Capu di Tutti Capi, or boss of all bosses. So there would be five individual families in New York, and 
any families from other states would all be grouped into one family per state. So you got like the Chicago family and all of the leaders of the family would come together and they would all report to Maranzano. About three months after Luciano killed Masseria and the five families were created, he also killed Maranzano after they had some beef and Maranzano planned to have him killed. It was a whole thing. Luciano took out Maranzano, but he left his ideas in place. One thing that he changed was he chucked the position of Capu di Tutti Capi. He made it so that there was a commission, a ruling body of leaders of the important families that would settle disputes among made members who were just members that were a group of the Italian mafia. So now that we've gone through that for the umpteen time, Castello was a young Turk, he was on Masseria's side, and he was boys with Luciano. The castello Morisi War put everybody in the Italian Mafia completely out of commission from February of 1930 to April of 1931. Castello went full steam ahead. In 1932, Castello was introduced to all of the guests at the Democratic Convention at the Drake Hotel as a political contributor. He shook hands with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the Democratic candidate for president who we all know today did end up becoming president. So he's starting to become a really important person. Luciano became the leader of one of the five families in New York as promised, and he made Genovese his underboss. Probably the biggest mistake that he ever made, and he made Costello his consigliere. Things soon went sideways though, and Fiorella LaGuardia was voted in as mayor of New York, and he was absolutely unviable. He immediately declared war on the slot machines that had been placed in New York. He went around, he took all the slot machines out of their places in New York, and he brought them into one big pile, and he took a sledgehammer to these slot machines. He did this in front of the press, obviously, as some, like, political statement that he was going to take out the slot machines. And just for good measure, he threw about 1,500 slot machines into the Long Island Sound. I bet you you could still go if you had the balls to swim wherever the hell he put those slot machines. I bet you to this day, you could probably go scuba dive and find those slot machines. I'd be so interested to see one of those slot machines. I've swam in the Long Island Sound many a times. I can't say that I haven't. Um, considering all the beaches on the north end of Long Island are the Long Island Sound, I can't count the number of times I've gone to Jones Beach for concerts or for swimming, you know, just a day at the beach. It's it's a place that anybody from New York, lower New York, not, you know, friggin' Canada up there and upstate, but anybody from, you know, New York City or Long Island, you know these beaches. And anybody from Long Island knows about the tunnel that goes into Jones Beach and that if you yell in it, it echoes. So if there's any Long Island people here, sound off, tell me about your stories of going to Jones Beach and yelling into the tunnel that echoes back. Around this time, Costello developed polyps on his vocal cords. He saw two different doctors about what to do about these polyps. One suggested cutting the polyps out and the second advised burning them off. He went with option B, and when they were burning the polyps off, they ended up burning his vocal cords really bad. This led Costello to have a really deep, gritty, raspy voice for the rest of his life, and he was really embarrassed about it. He hated his new voice. It was like the bane of his existence. Later on, when he was talking to an author who was writing a book, he would kind of sit back and like contemplate and be like, yeah, I, I just, I went with the wrong doctor. It is still to this day eating me up to know what the relationship is between Sarah J. Moss and Peter Moss. I know that he's not her father. He can't be her father because Sarah J. Moss took her last name from her husband, Josh W. Moss. I think it has to be either Josh's dad or his uncle. I don't know how they haven't publicly come out and said anything about the fact that Sarah J. Moss, one of the best YA writers ever, and Peter Moss, a huge mafia historian, have the same last name. I want to know. I wish I knew. It bothers me. It bothers me. To the point that I literally reached out to Sarah J. Moss on Instagram and asked her, like, what is the relation with Peter Moss? I need to know. I want to know. I don't think she's going to answer me because she has, like, 854,000 followers on Instagram, 
but if she ever does answer me, I will definitely let you know, and you guys will be the first audience ever to know what the relationship is because Sarah J Moss's audience damn sure does not know. So I want to know. I want to report it back to you guys. And I'm just, I'm really curious. I swear to God, if she was like doing live events right now, I would like call in and ask her like, who is Peter Moss to you? I want to know. Like, tell me. And she probably doesn't even realize that it's something that anybody in the world would be curious about. But you got her who is from New York. She met her husband, I believe, at school, so I'm not even sure if Josh W. Moss is from New York, but she's from New York. So you got the same last name from the same area in Manhattan, and it's eating me alive. I need to know. I need to know if it's her husband's, like, uncle, because that's so cool. She's such a big writer. I am a huge fan of her books. Like, one of her series is actually getting turned into a show on Hulu right now. And I love her series, and obviously I love Peter Moss's writing. He has alluded so much about the Mafia, and he wrote the Valachi Papers. He, he did a lot of work for Mafia history. So to have one of the biggest and best writers of our own time have some mysterious relationship with the bigger and best Mafia writer from back then, it's just, it's a cool little circle that I want to see closed. I want to know what the relationship is. Costello told Moss that his gritty voice, as well as one time when he spied on his mistress, were the two things that he was the most embarrassed about in his entire life. He told Moss about his partnership with Joe Kennedy, JFK, and Robert Kennedy's father. They were partners in the bootlegging business, and they had a really big bootlegging business going on in New York. And their partnership even went to New Orleans. Costello's relationship with Kennedy is what led to JFK's eventual assassination. Joe Kennedy promised the mafia that if they helped his son get elected as president, he would help get some of the guys that had been exiled back into America with citizenship papers. And he made a lot of other promises that he just kind of didn't follow through with, but that is actually the first official time in Peter Moss's book. That's the first time that we see any sign that Costello had a business relationship with Joe Kennedy. Robert Kennedy, Joe's second son, declared war on the mafia, and he spent the entire time between when JFK was elected president until when he was killed and Robert was ousted from the DA's office, putting all the important members of the mafia on trial. Costello always had a mistress. Loretta even knew about the mistress. And this might be the saddest thing I think I've ever heard in my entire life. She was okay with him having a mistress because she couldn't bear Costello a child. Like, I know that it's pretty typical for mafia wives to be okay with their husbands having a mistress. That's nothing crazy. That's completely normal. Once in a while, you know, they'll throw a pot at their head and get their point across that, like, they're the more important one than the mistress. And that's perfectly fine, whatever, you know, if you guys are okay with that, do you, boo-boo, like, whatever. But to be okay with it because you have fertility issues, like, it's just, it's heartbreaking. It makes me so sad. Can you imagine being okay with your significant other having somebody else to have sex with because of your fertility issues? Like, it's freaking, it's heartbreaking. It's sad. And it's not like he was off having kids with other women. I don't know why her fertility meant anything or was, like, the reason that she was okay with him playing around because... It's not like he has kids out there. He never had kids with any of these other girls that he, you know, made a home with. It was it, it was just, oh, I can't have kids. So yeah, you could go have sex with other people. It just doesn't, it doesn't compute. It doesn't line up, but it is what it is. And she was okay with it because of that. He's kind of a scumbag for that, if you ask me. Because the fact that she believed that means that he provoked that in some way. Like, Dude, go have all the mistresses you want. You know, like all your friends are running around with mistresses. It is what it is. You want to have them, go for it. But don't come home and make your wife feel like it's her fault because she can't have kids. Like the fact that she said, oh, well, you know, I'm okay with it because I can't have kids. It means that at one point he was like, yeah, you can't even have kids. So uh, I'm going to do what I want. You know, like he's just a douche because... All the other mafia guys, they all have mistresses and they have a ton of kids at home. So obviously that's not it. 
And the only reason she continued thinking that way is because he let her. If he would have come home and be like, listen, I am going to have sex with other women, but it has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that you can't have kids. If he had done that, who knows what way she would have thought. You know, she might have thrown a pot at his head every once in a while and gotten mad that he cheated, but been okay with it the way that the rest of the women were. So I don't know. It just bothers me that he let her think that. He lived in the Majestic Hotel in Central Park West with Loretta, and he got an apartment on Fifth Avenue with his mistress, Thelma Martin. When he had suspicions that Thelma was cheating on him, he got an apartment across the street and he got a telescope. He pretty much got that apartment so that he could spy on Felma to see if she was cheating on him. And he would later say that it was one of the most embarrassing things he ever did in his life. After the LaGuardia took out all of Costello's slot machines, Huey Long, the kingfish governor of Louisiana, reached out to Costello. Long and Costello got acquainted when Long was at a party in Long Beach and Costello was also at that party. In a drunken stupor, Long had to pee and he went to pee and there was somebody in the urinal already. So this drunken moron decides that it would be a great idea to try to pee in between this dude's legs. And obviously it didn't work because he's drunk off his face and he peed on the guy and the guy was about to kick the shit out of him and Costello pretty much stepped in he was like whoa 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 guys this doesn't need to be a fight like no you're not gonna beat him up I know he peed on you I'm very sorry he's very sorry let me go buy you a drink he just kind of like he paved the way so Long didn't get his ass beat that night and ever since then they became really good friends and Long really liked him he got in contact with Costello and let him know that he could bring the slot machines to New Orleans and he would let him place as many as he wanted to in as many places as he wanted to all over New Orleans, all just for a 10% piece of the pie. Costello called the New Orleans Mafia and asked for the name of somebody that would be like a reliable, loyal person that could handle his operations on the ground. They said that that sounded exactly like Carlos Marcello was made for the role, but there was just one problem. Marcello was currently in year five of a nine-year sentence. Costello is like, okay, prison? Hold my beer. Like, just give me one second. He got on the phone and had Marcello out of jail by the weekend. And Marcello, who at the time was like an up-and-comer, was still like young and he was freshly married. He's just like this young kid and he comes out and he starts running all the gambling operations on the ground for Costello. He turned it into an empire. He expanded to the entire South of America. And that revenue alone would have made Costello like a multi-millionaire. He really didn't need to do anything other than just get Marcello to, you know, do all of his work for him. He definitely chose the right guy for the job. And I do feel like it always works out that way whenever somebody gets somebody out of jail. They're legit, like, forever grateful. It always, like, makes this sense of loyalty. Like, look at Anastasia for Luciano. Anastasia was on death row, and Luciano got him out, and he was, like, his most loyal soldier until he died. And then you look at, like, Marcelo for Costello. It it's like adopting a rescue dog instead of buying a dog. Like, they know the life they had, they know that you got them out of it, and they are forever loyal to you for giving them the life that you did. So Costello packs his whole gambling business up and he moves it to New Orleans. He didn't want to go to New Orleans, so he had Phil Castell, who was like one of his major partners. He had Castell physically move to New Orleans to run the business there along with Carlos Marcello. And he partnered Castell up with Marcello and he just kind of, you know, let them go roam, do their thing, and he stayed back in New York. In 1936, Costello gets absolutely decimated with an arrest, that of Lucky Luciano. Luciano was arrested after Thomas Dewey and Eunice Carter, the DA and ADA of New York, led a manhunt 
trying to catch Luciano on something. They ended up raiding 200 brothels in Manhattan and Brooklyn and pretty much forced these girls to say that Luciano was the one that was running the prostitution ring. They forced the girls to do that because they took an arrest that was typically an ROR arrest. Usually when someone was arrested for this charge, they were just ROR'd and put back on the street. For this set of girls, they gave them a $10,000 bail which means that none of them would have been able to get out of jail. They would have all had to just sit there until their trials, which could have been months. So now they tell them, like, you're going to sit there for months or you're going to say what we want you to say. And they said it and they got Luciano on compulsory prostitution and pretty much got what they wanted. They got him put in prison. Luciano was arrested on 62 counts of compulsory prostitution after a brief stint on the run in Hot Springs, Arkansas, where in the most unlucky turn of events, a detective saw him and snitched. He, like, gave his detective friend a call. It was like, yo, that guy you're chasing? Yeah, he's here. It's crazy. I never expected to see him here. So, yeah, he got locked up. It was shitty. He was given 30 to 50 years in prison on June 18th, 1936, and that was the end of the road. He continued leading the family from prison, but he left Genovese in place as the acting boss of his family because Genovese was his underboss. That's, that's usually what happens. The only problem was that Genovese actually ended up fleeing the U.S. and headed to Naples to avoid a murder indictment. Genovese was fleeing from an indictment of Ferdinand Baccia, a fellow member of the Mafia. Genovese scammed this wealthy gambler out of like $150,000 in a high-stakes card game. And this high-stakes card game is what makes me think that when Arnold Rothstein said that he had lost all this money and it was like a scam, like that's what makes me think like, yeah, it probably was a scam because of this situation. Genovese got his hands on this wealthy gambler. He scammed him out of $150,000. So, yeah, Arnold Rothstein probably was killed because he was scammed. But anyway, Baccia is the one that introduced Genovese to this wealthy gambler, so he demanded $35,000 as pretty much like a finder's fee for introducing Genovese to this gambler. Genovese and five of his associates decided to kill Baccia on September 19th, 1934, rather than just pay him the $35,000. After Luciano was given the 30 to 50 year prison sentence, Genovese got spooked that he was going to be indicted on this murder and he must have gotten a tip or something that someone was working with the DA's office because it really doesn't make sense any other way. They really were coming for him. He wasn't crazy. He left for Italy on November 26th, 1936, which is two years after they killed this man. So it wasn't just, you know, him going crazy. Like he had a reason to run. So however he got word, he got word that they were coming and he jets off on November 25th. When he got to Italy, he went to Nola, a city near Naples. I've always absolutely despised Fido Genovese. Legit, every single episode that I have ever mentioned his name, I've made sure to call him like a scumbag, a scuzz bucket, something nasty. I always make sure to throw that in. I will never do an episode on him for the same reason I'll never do an episode on a rat. I just, I hate them. I hate who they are down to their very fiber of being. I never knew the extent for which I had a right to hate Genovese though. So we're going to go through that here. We know Genovese had to flee the U.S. when Luciano got arrested, but what I personally did not know was that Genovese made nicey-nice with Mussolini in Italy. Yeah, that guy that was BFFs with Hitler and, like, wanted to kill all the Jewish people in the world? The fascist government that had mafia members, women and children beaten, raped, and killed? Like, yeah, there's Genovese's BFF. By the end of World War II, Genovese had donated nearly $4 million to Mussolini's fascist party. That would be a little over $81 million today. Not only was he friendly with them, but he organized hits in America on their behalf. That means that he had people killed that were against the fascists. It blows my mind that this man should have been hung in the town square for war crimes, and he wasn't. Like, who's friends with the fascists? Literally everybody hated them. Everybody. And this man's out here giving them $81 million and killing people for them. 
Like, oh, you're against the fascists? The entire mafia in America was against the fascists. Every single one of them were against him. He arranged for the murder of Carlo Tresca to happen in America from Italy. Tresca was the publisher of an anarchist newspaper in New York, and apparently that made him enemy number one to Mussolini, so he had to go. Genovese made the call, and Tresca was killed on January 11th, 1943, by a gunman outside his office in Manhattan. On top of that, Genovese also helped to create a new fascist party headquarters in NOLA, and he was awarded the Order of the Saints Maurice and Lazarus, and made a commendatory, which is a member of the Italian Honorary Order of Chivalry, who ranks next above an officer and next below a grand officer, pretty much making him a commander in the Italian forces, all by Mussolini. It's beyond me how after World War II, when they took the officers who worked for Hitler and lined them up and shot them, Genovese wasn't among those people being shot down. They just allowed him to come back to America and be a mafia boss. Like, out of control. Out of control. Allegedly, he did this to make life for himself easier, but having people in the States killed for them is not just making your life easier. There's being nice, there's trying not to piss someone off, and being friends with somebody, and then there's being nice, donating $81 million to them, and having somebody killed in a different country for them. Three totally different levels of being nice. Now, the Allied invasion goes down in September of 1943. I went into a lot of detail about this invasion in my Luciano video, so again, if that's something that you're interested in, go check out that video. I went into it a lot because Luciano actually had a huge hand in helping set up the Allied invasion, and this was a huge reason why the U.S. was able to invade so easily and win control of Italy so easily and quickly and efficiently. On July 25th, 1943, the people of Italy voted Benito Mussolini out of power. He was arrested upon leaving a meeting with King Vittorio Emmanuel, who had stated that the war was already lost. This is another subject I went into a lot in the Luciano video, but a quick version. Italy had a king at the time. It was later voted to become a republic, and the king and his family were exiled because they worked with Mussolini. But the king had fought Mussolini for a really long time and eventually just kind of like said, whatever, I'm done fighting, do what you gotta do. And when he did that, Mussolini turned around and signed a pact with Japan and Germany and declared war on the Allied powers. After the king had announced that the war was already lost, Mussolini was voted out of power and General Pietro Badaglio took over as the Prime Minister of Italy. The Allied invasion of Italy was successful after 38 days of fighting. They were fighting to get the Axis powers out of Sicily, and on September 17, 1943, General Badaglia was voted in as the Prime Minister when Mussolini was voted out, and then on October 13, 1943, the government of Italy declared war on its former Axis partner Germany and joined the battle on the side of the Allies. All of that was because of Luciano. All of that was something that Genovese fought against. I'm like actually getting angry. I'm sitting here and like actually physically getting angry right now. This is actually just a really brief overview. The entire story is really, really interesting. That's why I went into it pretty deeply in the Luciano video. So if you're interested in history and the way things moved and why they turned out the way that they did and why they are the way they are today, you should go check out the Luciano video because the whole history of it, I found it very interesting. I've always kind of been into history, so, you know, take my word with a grain of salt, but I just thought it was really interesting. I thought the way that you can actually see things go down is very eye-opening. I didn't know. I was so not informed on these topics that, like, I didn't even know that Italy had ever been an Axis power, so... You know, reading up on this stuff has really opened my eyes to the way that things went down and why they are the way they are today. 
So the Allied invasion happens, Mussolini is ousted, Italy is now an Allied power, everything is looking up for everybody except two people, Mussolini and Vito Genovese. Remember, right now he is in Italy on the run from America for a murder charge that he knows is going to go down in America soon. He's just spent the last seven years financially backing the fascist government of Mussolini and supporting him through declaring war on America. This is not good news for Genovese. So when the Allied forces move into Italy, Genovese is like, oh fuck, I am screwed. So he quickly goes to the U.S. Army and he offers support to the U.S. Army. Literally, this guy reminds me of the rat guy from Harry Potter. You know the guy that like literally turns into a rat? His name is Peter Pettigrew. Like as a human he acts like a rat and that is exactly who I think of when I think of Vito Genovese. I don't think of like his actual picture. I think of Peter Pettigrew. He's like a little rat. I hope this guy is burning in hell right now. So Genovese goes to the U.S. Army and starts making nice with Charles Paletti, a commander in the army who would later become the governor of New York. Genovese gave him a 1938 Packard sedan, and Puletti accepted the car. It cost around $1,100 when the car came out new, which would equal out to about $20,000 today. That's literally chump change. A 22 Honda Civic costs $22,350 MSRP. And keep in mind that he gave him this car in 1943, which means that the car is already five years old. He gave Mussolini four million dollars and he gave america a car that costs less than a honda civic today the sad thing is america ate this up they were all about it this is the stone ages so they literally have like no idea who the hell this dude is they have no idea he's there on the run from a murder charge they just think he's like some Italian dude that probably told him that he had like gone to America or something slimy and they're just like, all right, cool. This dude's gonna, you know, help us out. He's gonna give us stuff. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take a car. They put him into position as an interpreter for the U.S. Army. They can't speak Italian. He can. So they send him on some missions with some troops that they need to interact with the locals. He's also considered a liaison officer, pretty much just meaning that he's helping the troops when they go out on missions. He's helping them. He's translating for them. He's talking to the people for them. He's letting them know like, oh, this is the traditions and customs of these people. So he's just helping the U.S. Army. He quickly becomes one of the AMGOT's most trusted employees. The AMGOT, or the Allied Military Government for Occupied Territories, is pretty much just the decision makers for the Allied Forces, and they make decisions on behalf of the Allied Forces in country. So Genovese gets together with Caligero Vizzini, an Italian gangster from the Mafia over in Italy, and they set up a black market operation transporting food commodities. The AMGOT signs off on import and export papers for this illegal transport so it can bring all basic food commodities to Naples and Sicilies and just pretty much bring food commodities to the troops wherever they're at. I'm honestly not 100% sure what's going on here. I, I don't really know because there's not a lot of information on whatever the hell is going on here and I don't know why it's illegal. Like, they're transporting food commodities to American troops. You would think it would be super simple for them to make it legitimate. Like, my research also says that, like, some corrupt army officials would actually make contributions of gasoline and trucks to the operation. But if they're transporting food commodities, I don't know why it would be so illegal. I don't know why an officer would have to be crooked in order to make contributions. So something's going on here that I just, I don't know. Luke Monzelli was an American lieutenant in the Carabinieri, assigned to follow Genovese during his time in Italy. He said truckloads of food supplies were shipped from Vizzini to Genovese, all accompanied by proper documentation, which had been certified by men in authority. So again, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm not spending my time researching Genovese. I don't care. I'm just telling you why you should hate him too. But I'm not about to go on some quest and find out what the hell is going on here. I don't care about him enough. I don't see anything saying that they were transporting drugs or anything illegal in these convoys, so... 
Again, I don't know why it's illegal, but it is. So now things are going splendidly in Italy again. Nobody's bashing Genovese's skull in for financing a regime that supported genocide. Well, whatever. Nobody has realized that he's in Italy on the run from a murder conviction in the United States. He's running a black market convoy of food supplies in Italy. Life is going beautifully for him. In the summer of 1944, shit starts to catch up with him. Karma is a bitch, and you can never run from her for long. Back in the States, mobster Ernest the Hawk Rapolo was arrested for the murder of Baccia. He was facing life in prison, so of course he decided to flip. He gave up Genovese and told the feds that Genovese had him killed so he didn't have to pay the $35,000 for matching him up with the gambler that he ripped off. He also told them where Genovese was. At the same time that this is going on, these black market runs of food commodities that Genovese has been doing in Italy start to not look so innocent. They start investigating it and they're like, oh shit, how did we not see this before? He's been stealing trucks, he's been stealing flour, and he's been stealing sugar from us. We were so blind, we were so cool with this dude, and he's really not a good dude. So now they're pissed. They feel like somebody's gotten something over on them. They feel like he's been robbing them blinds and they supported him and they're they're mad. So when shit starts to go sideways, this dude, Agent Orange, <laughs> Agent Orange, <laughs> Orange. <laughs> if you don't know what I'm laughing about, fuck you for being so young. Agent Orange C. Dickey of the Criminal Investigation Division which, having been in the army in an MP battalion, let me tell you, those CID boys do not play around. They are not people you want to mess with. They suck. Like, they're the worst of the worst. They arrest you if you do absolutely anything against army rules. You don't have to break the law. You just have to break army rules. I'm talking, if you fail a drug test, you're in there getting fingerprinted and getting your mugshot taken. Full arrest. So this CID dude, Agent Orange, he comes up there and he's looking into Genovese and he knows that he has some history in America because that's what made Genovese approach the American army in the first place. So he's like, all right, this something happened in America. He has some ties to America. So now the Americans in Italy give the Americans in America a call. And as soon as the Americans in Italy call the Americans in America, America is like, yo, um, actually, we're glad you called. I'm sure you've never heard of this dude, but there's this bad motherfucker named Vito Genovese, and he fled from America on a murder charge. He's in NOLA. Like, have you heard of him? Do you know anything? And then the Americans in Italy are like, wait, Vito? Vito Genovese? No way. No way! Like, we, we kind of had a feeling about this dude. This dude, Agent Orange, has been telling us that something's weird about the dude, and we had a feeling, and it's funny that you said that, because we were actually calling you to ask you about this dude. So yeah, we know who he is, and okay, great, now we know. Now we both know that he's bad. Now we know that he's on the run from a murder charge. It's not just like, oh, he's robbing, you know, flour and sugar anymore. He killed someone. So, uh... Thanks so much. Makes sense. Let's get this taken care of. So now, Dickey is on the hunt. He wants Genovese and he wants him bad. But the problem is, is that Genovese has already greased the pockets of all the higher-ups of Americans in Italy. And they don't want that to stop. So the Americans in Italy, they're like, eh... Uh, so what? Murder? Like, that's not that bad. Okay, he killed someone. Like, do we really care so much? Do we really care so much? He gave us an $1,100 car, okay? They're like, murder? So what? So what? Leave him alone. God, you're always trying to arrest someone. You're so annoying. Leave him alone. Like, he's paying us. Shut up. He puts hundreds of dollars a week into my pocket, okay? You're not arresting him. Leave him alone. But Dickie is not being deterred. He's on a mission to get this guy. His entire chain of command, I'm talking every single one of them. So a chain of command, pretty much what that is, is that if you're a junior enlisted, I don't know Dickie's rank, it, it never, I really never went looking for his rank, but if you're junior enlisted, you'll have like a sergeant, you'll have a staff sergeant, you'll have 
a sergeant major, you'll have a BC, a commander. So you got all of these people above you, and that's a chain of command. It's just someone's superiors that are above them, and they give the orders to people below them. So now all of Dickie's chain of command are telling him to drop it. They don't care what Genovese did. They just want him to leave it alone because Genovese has been paying them. But Dickie is like, nah, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. I'm arresting this man. The people in America gave me permission, and that is what I'm going to do. The guys in America that gave me permission to arrest him have a lot more rank than you, and I'm doing it. I don't care. Try and stop me. So he goes ahead, and and this guy's got bullets because he arrests Genovese. When he arrests Genovese to have him sent back, Genovese offers him $250,000 to let him go. And Dickie, again, these CID boys, they're not the ones to play with. Dickie is like, nah, bro, I just worked my ass to get you arrested in the first place. Kick rocks. I don't want your stupid 250 grand. Then Genovese turns around. He's like, hey, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your whole family. And I'm going to kill anyone you've ever met. Just so you know, if I go to America, everybody you've ever met dies. And still, Dickie's like, nah, ha ha, you going to jail, motherfucker, you ain't gonna do shit. So he sends him back and Genovese goes back to America. Genovese was extradited and arrived back in America on June 1st, 1945. The next day, he was arraigned on the murder charges for the 1934 Bacio killing, and he obviously pled not guilty. There was a few witnesses to the crime... And they're all ready to testify that Genovese was the one that gave the order to kill this dude. The first was Peter La Tempa. La Tempa was in protective custody when he was found dead in his jail cell. He had enough poison in him to kill six horses. That is some Jeff Epstein didn't kill himself type shit right there. <laughs> Another was Jerry Esposito, who was found shot to death in New Jersey. Ernest the Hawk Rapolo survived... But without anybody to corroborate his story, there wasn't any chance of getting a murder charge to stick to Genovese. While dismissing the charges against him, the judge made it very clear to Genovese that he really wanted to see him fry in the electric chair. In my opinion, I truly believe that right here, this moment in the story, is where the government flipped Genovese, and I am 100% convinced that he was a rat. I'll go through it a lot more and I'll tell you why I think that, but I wanted to step in at this point and say that this is the point that I think Genovese flipped when this murder charge was being arraigned. So now, while all of this shit is going on, Genovese ran from America away from the murder charges on November 25th, 1936. Costello steps up and he is the acting boss for the Luciano family. We all know that Albert Anastasia and Bugsy Siegel put together a group called Murder Incorporated that handled any professional hits that needed to be carried out for the five families or for the Jewish Mafia. Well, when people started to get pinched in Murder Inc., there was a domino effect. Person A would get life, they would testify, they would convince person B to become a witness, Person B would become a witness, person B would testify, person B would convince person C to become a witness, and on and on and on. At the beginning of this domino effect is Abe Kid Twist Rells. Rells was a recruiter that sent men to Murder Incorporated to work for them carrying out hits. When Rells decided to turn informant, everybody knew that they were screwed. Rells had extensive knowledge of Murder Incorporated, and he had a lot of information on the Italians' involvement in Murder Incorporated as well. He could easily implicate the very top people in the organization, including Anastasia. They all knew what needed to be done, but the problem was he was in protective custody. Tight protective custody. This man literally had a federal agent escorting him to go pee. He was never alone. Anastasia was more than capable of carrying out hits. Even hits that should have been delegated to somebody below him, he was still out there with the boys slaughtering people. He enjoyed it. He liked killing people. Now, I say this lightly because, like most of the other Mafia guys, Anastasia never laid his hands on anybody that wasn't in the Mafia. He's not out there killing women and children that are innocently walking down the road. These are guys in the life. They know what life they're in. They know what happens if you don't follow the rules. They know what the rules are. And they're very fully aware of what's going to happen when they step outside those rules. They have a very clear understanding that it may come down to this one day. 
it's a lot easier to get on board with somebody like Anastasia who killed a lot of people but only killed people in the mafia than to get on board with somebody like Al Capone who would blow up restaurants and bars when they didn't want to give him a cut and ends up killing a lot of innocent bystanders who would just get blown up because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's why I hate Al Capone, because a lot of innocent people died. No innocent people died from Anastasia. Anastasia killed a lot more people, but they were all people that agreed to be in the mafia, and they all did something that warranted them getting killed. That's a really important distinction. Well, at least it's important to me, and more importantly, it is to the guys in the life as well. Although Costello tends to be the peacemaker of the group, he's definitely one of the most deadly as well. He knows when somebody has to go, and he has the connections to make it happen when most everybody else doesn't. Anastasia knew that, and he reached out to Costello for help on Rells. He was determined to ensure that the Italians of Murder Incorporated survived this big snitch fest that was going on. Costello, with his crazy powers of persuasion, reached out to the cops that were guarding Rells. Against all odds, this man was able to strike a deal, even though the amount that he paid to strike this deal is kind of in question. Luciano says it was 50000 Lansky says it was 100000 Either way, Rells fell from six stories to his death, and the newspapers dubbed him the canary that could sing but couldn't fly. On January 3rd, 1946, after Luciano helped America win the war, his sentence was commuted. When he was let out of prison, it was on the condition that he be immediately deported to Italy. Costello, Anastasia, and three or four other guys went and had a farewell dinner with Luciano before he left America in February. In late 1946, Luciano had moved to Havana, Cuba in secret. Lansky called a meeting of the commission in Havana that December, which would come to be known as the Havana Conference. The representatives said that they were going to see Frank Sinatra perform, but it was really a commission meeting that Luciano would be able to attend. They discussed three topics, the heroin trade, Cuban gambling, and the hotel of Bugsy Seagulls that was failing. Genovese spent a good chunk of time there trying to convince Luciano to take on the role of Capu de Tutti Capi and let him run that role while Luciano was in Cuba. Luciano, at this point, does not trust Genovese. He's quoted as saying, There is no boss of bosses. I turn that down in front of everybody. If I ever change my mind, I will take the title on. But it won't be up to you. Right now, you work for me, and I ain't in the mood to retire. Don't ever let me hear you talk about this again, or I'll lose my temper. Luciano was not secretive about being in Cuba. He was publicly hanging out with Sinatra. He was visiting a ton of nightclubs. There was a lot of things that he was photographed doing. But when the U.S. government finally got intelligence that he was in Cuba, they went to Cuba and threatened them. They told Cuba that as long as Luciano was there, the U.S. would not send any narcotic prescription drugs to them. Two days later, the government of Cuba detained Luciano and put him on a Turkish freighter back to Italy. When he was discovered to have been in Cuba by the U.S. government, he was under the impression that it was Genovese that tipped the U.S. off. I fully believe this. He called Genovese to his room and threw him the beating of a lifetime. After Luciano was done with him, Genovese had three broken ribs and was bedridden for three days. We also heard about the possibility that Genovese tipped off the government about the Appalachian meeting after he called the Appalachian meeting himself. How much you want to bet that he ended up getting out of that murder charge because he flipped and it just never got out that he was a rat. There are huge moments, the Havana Conference, the Appalachian Conference, these are gigantic moments for them underground, especially the Appalachian meeting that he called and just so happened to get raided in one of the highest number of mafia members that were ever arrested at an event in history. It came out that it was like really bad for Genovese. Bad things happened to Genovese because of the Appalachian Conference. Bullshit. I guarantee you the government was doing everything they could to make it look like Genovese was not a rat so that he could continue setting these Mafia members up in this way. I guarantee you, Costello's bootlegging partner, Joseph Kennedy Sr., ended up turning on him. When he had reached out asking for help getting his son elected president, 
Costello was more than happy to assist his longtime friend and get his son elected as president. Kennedy had made promises, a lot of really big promises, to get some exiled members of the Mafia back into America, including Luciano and Joe Adonis. He also promised that the Kennedy administration wouldn't really go hard at La Cosa Nostra. He would kind of let them live their lives. Honestly, I may do an episode on Joseph Kennedy one day because this man was a bigger criminal than any of the Mafia guys that I've ever covered. And that's including Anastasia with who knows how many bodies under him. It's wild to see how these men are regaled in history and they should have gone to jail at that time for war crimes. Not for the mafia activity that they did, but for war crimes. And they should have been lined up with the rest of the Nazis in Germany and had a bullet put in their head. Oh wait, I forgot. America was where the Nazis came to hide after they fled Germany. I didn't really forget. So now things just keep moving forward. Luciano is no longer in prison. He's in Italy. He helped the United States win World War II. Costello is the acting boss of the family, but there hasn't been any major issues while he's been the family. Genovese is now out of the murder rep. He's living, you know, a peaceful, luxurious life in America again. And now Costello starts to do everything that he can to live a peaceful and luxurious life in America as well. He goes to the most relaxing spas. He eats at the most decadent restaurants. He goes to the Central Park Zoo on a regular basis to look at the animals. He's also making boatloads of money. He's invested in properties on Wall Street. He's one of Bugsy Siegel's main investors to bring the Las Vegas Strip to life. He has his gambling revenue going on in New Orleans, which has moved to California, Texas. It's, it's moving all over America. So things are going really well for Costello. In January of 1949, he became the vice chairman of the Salvation Army. When he was given the title, they threw a dinner in his honor at the Copacabana, which he's actually believed to be the secret owner of. Eight judges, as well as many members of Congress and members of Tammany Hall, attended the event. Time Magazine put him on the cover, naming him America's number one mystery man. Things took a turn for the worst in 1951. Senator Keith Offer was elected, and this man was just intent on destroying everything and everyone. I was just watching an episode of Bailey Sarians today, and she started talking about Key Foffer, and I'm like, what the hell could she possibly be talking about Key Foffer about? She's never talked about mafia, guys. Key Foffer, as we all know, led committee trials against anybody that had ever even been suspected of being part of the mob. So I keep listening because I'm like freaking out. I'm like, oh my God, has she decided to do Mafia Guys and like my videos are over? But apparently Keith Offer also had another pet project of people that he wanted to destroy. He decided he wanted to come after pop culture. He believed that the media, television, comic books, magazines, that they were responsible for the corruption of America's youth, as well as the rise in juvenile crime. She was doing an episode on Betty Page, who was, like, hardcore attacked by him, and they formed, like, a Senate subcommittee. The Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency, which attacked the comic book industry first, and then they started to branch out. After there was a teenager that had died from what appeared to be suicide, hanging from a tree in the same bondage pose that Betty Page had done a cover on. There's a lot to the story, it's sad, but if you want to know more on that, go check out Bally Sarian's video. Her video was on Betty Page. So anyways, before he started attacking pop culture, he attacked all the Mafia members in America. He called every man, woman, and child that had ever even had a rumor spread about them that they were involved in Mafia activity. Everybody that appeared at the committee hearings walked out with a new, notorious name for themselves. But the two people that walked away with the most fame from the Kefauver hearings were definitely Costello and Virginia Hill. They became overnight celebrities in a way that they never could have imagined. Before, they were famous, but they were kind of like socialites. They would like pop up in the society section of the newspaper every now and then. They would get a magazine cover every now and then, but for the most part, they were usually in the back of the newspapers, not in the front. The Keith Offer trials, 
definitely changed that. For Virginia, it was changed because she did not give a shit. And she said some pretty nasty and crude shit. One remark that she made, and excuse my French, but it's a direct quote, was... Because I suck the best cock in town. The Keith Offer trials were a set of trials that took place in 14 cities, interrogating known mafia members in each one of those locations. They went through San Francisco, Los Angeles, Las Vegas, Kansas City, St. Louis, Chicago, New Orleans, Cleveland, Detroit, Tampa, Miami, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, and New York. America was absolutely enraptured with the Keith Offer trials. Not many homes at the time had a TV, so everybody would go to their local store or their local restaurant, wherever they knew that there was a television, and they would just crowd around the television and watch the Keith Offer trials. So many people watched these trials that it literally caused a problem for American retail stores. Nobody was shopping because everybody was busy watching these Keith Offer trials, and it caused a problem in retail. We can't really imagine that nowadays because really nothing that important happens anymore that affects everybody. Even famous trials that like everyone is obsessed with. I was obsessed with the George Floyd trial. My mom was obsessed with the Casey Anthony trial. Even those, they don't really capture everyone's attention. This did. Everyone watched. Everyone. If you weren't obsessed with this trial, you weren't in America. Costello requested that the cameras not focus on his face during the live broadcast, which was one of the very first live broadcasts in America. The weird thing is, if you Google what was the first live broadcast in America, the answer will come up to be President Harry Truman's speech at the Japanese Peace Treaty Conference in September 4th, 1951. This doesn't make any sense, though, because the Keep Offer trials were live and they aired in March of 1951. I even thought maybe because the Truman speech went from coast to coast, maybe the Keith Offer trials didn't go from coast to coast. Maybe that's why the Truman one would be considered first, but then I looked it up and the Keith Offer trials were broadcast from coast to coast. So I don't really know. Someone has something messed up. Maybe Keith Offer was the first ever and Google's wrong. The Keith Offer trial led movie theaters to show live coverage for free and the theaters were Act. Since Costello had requested that his face not be on the live broadcast, the camera zoomed in on his hands while he spent two days testifying. Kefauver dubbed Costello the Kapu d 2 t copy, even though we know that that position didn't exist. That's what Kefauver said Costello was. The cameras watched Costello fidget with his fingers as the committee flung every question in the book at him. The question started out by proving that there was a lie on his naturalization papers, which was ground for deportation. Rudolf Halley, the committee's interrogator, started the conversation by asking Costello if he had ever used an alias. Costello was convicted of a crime under the alias of Severo, which proved that he lied on his naturalization papers when he swore that he had never used an alias. He also sought to prove that he lied when he said that he was in real estate. He was trying to prove that he was actually in bootlegging at the time. He wasn't able to definitively prove that, given that Costello had never been officially convicted of doing any crime during his bootlegging time. Eventually, Costello told the committee that he had a sore throat and he couldn't continue to testify. He came back a few days later and answered some more questions. Committee members demanded that he reveal his net worth. Costello was kind of between a rock and a hard place. There was no right answer here. If he said the wrong answer, the IRS would come at him for tax evasion charges. If he said a more practical number, they could come after him for lying under oath. The only thing that he could think to do was refuse to answer. He pled the fifth. This is the part where... Judges decided that they didn't like the U.S. Constitution, so they just weren't going to listen to it anymore. They put Costello under arrest for contempt of court for refusing to answer that question, even though he had a right to do so. His right should be protected by the Constitution under the Fifth Amendment, but they decided they didn't like that, so he was arrested and he was put in jail for 18 months 
and given a $30,000 fine, which would be almost $330,000 today. In 1954, Frank Costello appealed the conviction, and he was released on $50,000 bail. From 1952 to 1961, he was in and out of a half a dozen federal and local prisons and jails. So he wasn't in jail the entire time, but he was found guilty, and then he'd be released, and then he'd be found guilty, and then he'd be released, etc., etc. So... For most of the time between 1952 and 1961, he was in jail. Willie Moretti, Costello's underboss and cousin, had syphilis. Back then, a lot of the time, syphilis was a death sentence. It is what killed Al Capone. He was known to be a little bit Looney Tune because of it, and nobody really minded. But Genovese convinced everybody that he had to be killed because he was a liability because of his little Looney Tune act. He rattled on that it was a mercy killing. While Costello was in jail on October 4th, 1951, Genovese went to Joe's elbow room in New Jersey and shot Moretti in the head and the feet. This was a really heavy blow for Costello. He loved him, and it came down hard on Costello when he died. Costello got out of jail in 1956. While Costello was in jail, Genovese had been the acting boss on the streets, and when Costello got out of jail, Genovese didn't want to give his position as boss up. In 1957, Genovese and Carlo Gambino, the underboss of the Anastasia family, attacked Frank Costello, who had taken leadership of the family back upon his release from prison. Genovese ordered Vincent de Chin Gigante to execute Costello. Gigante grabbed Costello as he was entering his apartment and shot him in the head. Gigante said, Hey Frank, this one's for you. As Costello turned around to see who had said that, Gigante shot his thirty-eight at Costello's head. But apparently he's a really bad shot or he's just dumb because he yelled out to him beforehand. So when he turned his head, he his head wasn't in the same place as when Vincent shot. He was at point blank range, but he barely grazed his head, and Costello lived. Costello did not cooperate with police, but since it was such a public attack, police arrested Gigante for attempted murder. He was later acquitted, and he publicly thanked Costello after the verdict was read out. Costello had no choice in the matter, and he decided to retire and hand over the reins of leadership to Genovese, and Luciano couldn't do anything to stop it. He was under such close scrutiny from police in Italy, he really couldn't do anything. Since it was a peaceful handoff of power, Costello just decided, like, all right, I'm gonna retire. You could have the position of boss if you want it that bad. Since it was peaceful, and since he also hadn't opened his mouth in court and had Gigante sent to prison for the rest of his life, Genovese allowed Costello to live. He didn't put a hit out on him. He didn't bar him from future mafia activity. He really didn't do anything other than take the position of boss of the family. That might be the only halfway decent thing that Genovese ever did in his entire life. After the Frank Costello hit, Joseph Bonanno arranged a sit-down between Albert Anastasia and Vito Genovese. He knew that one was needed because Anastasia was a deadly weapon himself. He was leading Murder, Inc., he killed people for fun, he liked it, and Costello was one of Anastasia's closest allies. He was leading the family for Luciano, who was Anastasia's best friend. Anastasia literally owed his life to Luciano, because Luciano stepped in and got Anastasia off of death row so that he could be an enforcer for him, so Anastasia literally owed his life to Luciano. Anastasia was leading his own family, and he had recently ensured that none of the Italians under him got put in jail for the Murder, Inc. downfall, and it took half the Jewish mafia down. He knew how lucky he was to get all his people out of that. He didn't want the publicity of a public mafia war, so he agreed not to kill him. But Genovese still had a promise to keep. He promised Carlo Gambino that he would help him rise to power and become the boss of his family if Gambino backed him on his power play. Five months later, on October 25th, 1957, while he sat for a cut and a shave at the Park Sheridan Hotel, Albert Anastasia was brutally killed by a group of men. Carlo Gambino took over as the leader of the family after Vito Genovese called the Appalachian meeting to order, gathering all the important mafia guys from the entire United States to meet in Appalachia, New York. It was raided, and over 130 mafiosi were arrested. Again, the mafia was in the spotlight, and every person that was arrested 
came to be known to the country as being associated with the mafia. Eventually, things died down. The Supreme Court threw out their case against Costello, where they were trying to revoke his citizenship, and they just left him alone. For the rest of his life, he continued to consult on mafia affairs. He remained a celebrity and kind of like, you know, hung out with actors and actresses. At the age of 82, he called Peter Moss, and he was finally willing to give information so that a book could be written about him. This was after he spent his entire life shunning any kind of media and absolutely refusing to give any information so that somebody could write a book. Peter Moss and Costello agreed to a six-month process where Moss would just pretty much come over and ask him questions and Costello would give him information. But only two months after they started working together, Costello died of a heart attack. He didn't have the kind of blowout funeral that's typical for Mafia guys. He only had about 50 people attend his funeral and none of them were in the Mafia. A year after he died, Carmine Galante got out of prison and bombed Costello's mausoleum. Galante was the one that killed Carlo Tesca for Vito Genovese and the fascist government. Carmine Galante will probably get an episode of his own one day too, but he was the dude that was killed at the restaurant on the patio with a cigar in his mouth. Well, that is all I have for you on the legendary Prime Minister of the Mafia. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you made it all the way to the end, I really appreciate it, and I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, follow, do all the things, and I'll see you next week. Bye!